If you have Bibles, let's go ahead and open them up to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And we will cover roughly the first half of this chapter today and the second half next week. Romans 13, we're going to talk about submission to authorities, talking about submission to authorities. And this is one of those things that, um, interestingly, people seem to have a lot of opinions on. Uh, and uh, I, think the, I think the thing to keep in mind is that uh, God has the correct view on things, and we need to go to Him and see what He says about it and understand how we ought to think about um, our relationship as human beings, but our relationship also as believers in Christ to the civil authorities whom God has appointed uh, at this time to be running things, as it were, or in our case, theoretically, <laughs> representing us in the way that they run things, even though it sure does not seem it works that way a lot of the time, uh, depending on, I guess, how you view things. Uh, our big idea for today is that God has appointed civil authorities to preserve the public good, and Christians are subject to them. Um, now, at the same time, this is kind of caveat time, at the same time, there is a place for what you would call civil disobedience. Okay? So, those two things are both true. We hold both of those things, sometimes one in one hand and the other in the other hand. Sometimes we have to kind of put them pretty close to one another, put them right by one another, and figure out how to navigate how we relate to the civil authorities that God has established and appointed in the world. This is one of those things that every time, and we're getting close to it, the elections roll around. Uh, I, I feel like I, I'm compelled to say that, okay, look, there are people who are running for various offices, and yeah, you are probably going to be dead opposed to some of them in many, many ways. And if those people get elected and placed in those positions, here's what you need to understand. They are appointed by God for those positions. Even if you disagree with them, even if you have strong and stringent opposition to the things that they try to legislate, the fact of the matter is God put them there. Even though you may have voted, and even if somebody you voted for got put there, God is still ultimately the one who puts them there. The book of Daniel says a handful of times, God is the one who raises up rulers and takes them down. Right? So, whenever we look at those who are holding offices, whether we agree with them, whether we disagree with them, the fact of the matter is God has them there for a purpose. Now, we don't always know precisely what that purpose is, aside from the big one, which is supposed to be to preserve the public good. That's the main thing that God has established the rulers, the civil authorities for. So our first fill in the blank goes right along with that. It's very simple. God ordained civil government. God ordained civil government. So there are, and, and the way that we've, uh, the church expressed this for centuries is that God has ordained essentially three primary institutions. God ordained the family, right? God, the family is God's idea. The second institution is that God ordained the church or the gathering of his people for the purpose of serving and worshiping God. And then the third one is the civil government. Civil government is actually God's idea. It was his thing that he created, just like the family, just like the, the worshiping people of God, the church, God ordained civil government. So let's go ahead and we'll go to Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 2, and it'll be right there. It'll be pretty obvious. 
Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Ooh. Now, there's a lot going on there that we will have to grapple with as we move through this passage that we will kind of come back to again and again. Uh, the very first thing is that uh, he says, let every person be subject let every person be subject to the governing authorities. God instructs the church to be good law-abiding citizens. That's what the command is. Right? We're commanded to be lawful people. We're commanded to not just go around and do whatever it is we feel like doing and be whatever it is we feel like being, but actually to be a people who in whatever setting we find ourselves are there for the establishment and the upholding of the order that God establishes through the civil authorities. We're, we're not here primarily or first and foremost at least to be disruptive. Now, does that mean there's not a place for disruptive? Well, as we will go and as we will see, there will, be, there will be moments where that actually is what we're not just maybe supposed to do, but what we're definitely supposed to do. You know, we live in a country that was in many ways established on that principle when things were not going as they should by the governing authorities. The, the founders of our country said... Uh, that's not right. And we want to see this done right, so we have to break away from that in order to establish this. Amen. So there, there is a place for that, and we will get to that. But let's keep with what the text says here. Let every person be subject. So the, the, the kind of the guiding principle is we're meant to be law-abiding citizens. He continues, for there is no authority except instituted by God. So, a couple of implications, three implications at least here. Number one is that God is the authority over all authorities, right? When we, when we look at the sermon uh, that Jesus gives, we would sometimes refer to as the Great Commission at the end of uh, the Gospel of Matthew, for example. It's, the versions of it show up elsewhere. In the book of Acts, he talks a little bit about it. But in, in Matthew, when Jesus Jesus is about to ascend after his resurrection, after he's been with his disciples for a number of days. He says, all what has been given to me? All authority has been given to me. Jesus is the one who possesses all authority, he says, in heaven and on earth. Jesus is king is what that means. And that's why we will say and use phrases like he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. He's the king who's over all kings. He's the Lord over all lords. He's the one who's the most in charge. The one who's the most in charge. So God is the authority over all authorities is the first implication of that. Second implication of that is that civil authorities are therefore accountable to God. There is a hierarchy here. That, that means that the civil authorities don't simply get to do whatever it is they want to do, which is our third implication, is that civil authorities therefore have boundaries. They do not have a blank check to run things however they feel like it, whatever whim occurs to them. This is not something that is pro-dictator. This is not pro-dictatorial, authoritarian kinds of things or settings or uh, structures of governance. This precludes those. 
This actually precludes those. And it does not, it, so basically what you have to understand is that a dictatorial style of government is dishonoring to God. And God will hold all of those kinds of rulers as he will hold every kind of civil authority. He will call them to account. He will, they will have to, every dictator, every president, every governor, every mayor will at some point have to stand before God, look him face to face and give an account of all of the things that they have done with their program, with how they ran things. They do not have a blank check to do whatever it is they feel like. So if you were to, for example, go back and read through the Old Testament, there is a long tradition of the prophets. And the prophet tradition that I'm referring to here is what you might call speaking the truth to power where there is this reality of the, the kings, for example, even just the kings of Israel. And we'll, we'll get to an example of this in, towards the end of the message today, where there is a, a king who is doing things outside of the way he should have been doing things, and a prophet says to that king, you're out of bounds here. You are not doing things the way God has authorized you to do them. So you need to repent and turn around and stop this nonsense. So there is a place where the civil authorities that God has established need to often hear that they are kept in check. That they ought to be very careful how they do things. They ought to be very careful. They have no blank check to just run things however they will. But that does not change the fact that the civil authorities are established by God for the purpose of promoting the public good. So Paul says, look, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And he puts this in there, will incur judgment will incur judgment. Now, this has to do specifically with resisting civil government in its rightful application, in its lawful application, not resisting it whatever its crazy whims might be. Sometimes it has some crazy whims and those ought to be resisted and we'll get to that in a little bit. But when we're talking about the civil government running things and trying to establish an orderliness to society, we don't resist that. We don't resist that. Because to resist that is actually to resist God himself. Because he put them there for that purpose. And if we go off sides here, we are in... Um, we're in the path of God's judgment there. Now, so there's, there's uh, going to be a word that gets used in the next section. And that word is wrath, right? The wrath of God. We talk about the wrath of God. And what we most often think about when we think about the wrath of God is things like fire from heaven, right? You know, there's, there's sort of a, an immediate death for somebody who's doing things like Ananias and Sapphira in the New Testament or Nadab and Abihu in the Old Testament or people who are, uh, you know, just doing something and God just judges them on the spot. But that's not the only way that God executes wrath. And we're, we're about to see the other way that he does that. Point number two, civil government is a vessel of God's reward and wrath. Civil government is actually a vessel that God established to meet out these two things, his reward and his wrath. Sometimes wrath comes through the authorities. Romans chapter 13, verses 3 through 4. Starting in verse 3. 
For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So he says, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Too often, people, and I'm sad to report too often, that includes Christians, use the word freedom when what we actually mean is lawlessness. We want things our way. Well, what if your way is actually a bad way? We stopped and thought about that. We don't like to think of our way as a bad way, but it is. That's why God gave us some external help with the civil authorities. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good for this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people live as people who are free not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil but living as servants of God honor everyone love the brotherhood fear God honor the Emperor we have to be careful we have to be careful that when we speak of protecting our freedoms, that we're not going about it in a lawless manner. That we're not going about it in a lawless manner. That we are actually, as Paul is urging us, and now here Peter, that we're going about it in a law-abiding way, in an orderly, God-pleasing way. Paul says, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. So God administers blessing and benefit through the civil government. God administers blessing and benefit through the civil government. Um, you are protected from foreign oppressors, right? Some, let's say some foreign country says, you know, I think I'm going to go take over America. Maybe not a great idea, but, you know, somebody gets it in their head to do so anyway. I don't, I don't care which country you pick for this. You just pick one in your head and that country says so we're gonna we're gonna go attack America and so they land on our shores or they try to come in through Canada or Mexico or whatever and they bring an army what's gonna happen what's gonna happen anybody I'm gonna go to work. yeah Devin, Devin you're gonna go to work right we have these these people called soldiers we have an army because we know that we need to protect our borders. We know that we need to protect our nation from external threats. So if we get an invading force, we have a force to fight back against that. That's a protection. That's a benefit that God established through the civil government. Now, that's just one example. You probably can come up with dozens and dozens of them. These protections uh, of freedoms, military protections, these are all examples of the blessing and the benefits that God administers through the civil authorities. So if you would have no fear of the one who is in authority, then do good, because they don't bear the sword in vain, he says. Because the civil authorities have a sword, and, that, and that's, the, that, that, that's symbolic of they have violence to use if necessary, right? That's why, that's why we arm police officers in cities, 
That, that's why they have those things. Whether they do right or don't do right all the time is not the discussion here. He says, but if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he, that's the civil government, he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So the section right before this concluded with an excursus on do not take vengeance, right? And why, does, why did Paul say do not take personal revenge? Because vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. Well, how does God sometimes execute his vengeance and his wrath? Well, sometimes he does it directly. Sometimes he uses an intermediary. And that intermediary in this case is the civil authority. That's why they have the power of the sword. When criminal activity is stopped and punished, that is an exercise of God's wrath in the present. God's wrath is not just something that happens some distant time in the future. It actually happens throughout history at various points. Every time the civil authorities leverage violence against a wrongdoer, that's actually the judgment of God at work. That's the judgment of God at work. Um, every year, um, the, the kids, uh, our kids, go through uh, a homeschool co-op, classical conversations, and in certain grades, they have these questions that they have to debate. And one of them that always comes up, or seems to come up frequently, is the question of capital punishment. Capital punishment is a bit of a hot-button topic, right? Should we be killing certain criminals? Well, what does God say? Genesis 9, 5 through 6. This is God speaking to Noah after the flood, after they've all come out from the boat. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of a man. Whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. Capital punishment instituted by God. And then we see it actually show up later in the law of God, where certain things had to be taken care of in a capital way. Now, the whole point of that was that it's not the preference, right? It's not the preference of God, I think, to, to do the executing of wrath to that level. But it is sometimes necessary it is sometimes necessary. So the question of, biblically speaking, the question of capital punishment is answered directly by God throughout His Word. Yeah, here, Genesis 9, Romans chapter 13, He does not bear the sword in vain. That sword isn't just sometimes to cause a little bit of an owie. Sometimes that sword is there to put to death. And then the civil authorities have to figure out the best ways to, to do that. And sometimes we've seen states outlaw capital punishment, and sometimes we've seen certain states enshrine capital punishment. And maybe both of those ways of doing things are not the best way. But it is, in the view of God, sometimes necessary that that gets meted out as a form of God's wrath as a form of God's wrath. Number three of four. God gave us civil government to hedge our conscience. One of the purposes that God gave civil government to us is knowing that individually we don't always do very well. And sometimes we need a bit of an external guide and a, a, a hedge, if you will. And so God gave civil government actually to hedge our conscience. Hedge our conscience. Romans chapter 13, verses 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7. 
Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. So therefore, he says, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid the wrath of God, not just to stay out of trouble, but also for the sake, he says, of your conscience. Your conscience is that inward witness that God has given to every person to do that which is right or to avoid that which is wrong. And sometimes our conscience is faulty because we've allowed certain things to influence it that shouldn't or because we never developed it in the way that we should. Well, because the conscience of humanity doesn't always operate in the way it should, sometimes God doesn't just give us the internal witness of the conscience, but He also gives us external limits and guidelines and hedges, like the civil government. This is why we have, love it or hate it, speed limits on our roads. How many of us have been driving down a road perhaps a little faster than we should have and saw in the mirror something that caused us to do that little prayer that goes, please no, please no, please no, please no, please no, please no, please no. That red and blue prayer, because we see those red and blue lights in our rearview mirror that tell us we're being pulled over because we were going a little too fast. And we always get that question from them, don't we? Do you know how fast you were going? See, I feel like this is a trick. <laughs> right? This is, you know, this is, yeah, just be honest. Either, yes, sir, I do know how fast I was going, or no, I was stupidly not paying attention to my speedometer. And then that whole interaction can fall out as uh, perhaps it should. But yeah, so, you know, our conscience sometimes needs an external help. And God has given us that in some ways in the form of the civil government. So our consciences require varieties of guides to keep them on course. So God's Word, the Holy Spirit, and yes, the civil government and its laws and enforcements are ex examples of those. They are examples of those. He says, for because of this, you also pay taxes. Everybody's favorite. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. So with all due respect to my libertarian friends, <laughs> taxation is not theft. It's actually instituted by God. Now, there is such a thing as overtaxation that we should perhaps talk about or bad taxes that should not be levied, or all of those things, but taxes in and of themselves are part of the system that God designed to support the ongoing function of the civil government that is there to preserve the public good. That is there to preserve the public good. So, taxes, paying taxes, is biblical. Is it a pain in the neck? Yes. Especially in the way our system is currently set up. I'm sure we could probably fix it. But they won't listen to me. <laughs> and I'm really bad with math, so they probably shouldn't listen to me. <laughs> but there are people who know what they're doing who probably could do better by it. But the fact of the matter is taxation is not theft. It's actually part of the design of God for how this thing is supposed to run. Now, it could probably use work. Yes, not saying anything different than that. But bear that all in mind when April rolls around and you have to fill out that form, right? So he says, pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes, revenue, respect, honor. God's people are meant to 
to benefit the civil government. Just like the civil government is meant to benefit you, we're actually meant to benefit the system that is meant then to benefit us. Right? Now, there's a passage I want to share with you. It's in Hebrews chapter 13. The passage specifically originally has application to leadership in the church. But there's a principle here that can be applied to the leadership of civil government as well. So I just want to put that out there. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that you would be of no advantage, for that would be of no advantage to you. So, we have these little jokes that we share how, how, how do we generally feel about politicians in this country? Not well, right? Not well. We, we, we think of politicians in this century the way that Jews thought of uh, tax collectors in the first century, which is not well. The reality of the matter is, is that we ought, instead of all the time be jabbing at them and I'm not there's not that's not to say there's no critique that's not deserved we ought to be as Paul says elsewhere to be praying for them to be lifting them up because those are people that have been appointed by God and, and if we resist them we have to be careful that we're not resisting God in the process so that's the main part that I wanted to share that was through uh, Romans 13. Now I have a, a bit of an extra bit, a fourth point. Uh, that asks this question, when is civil disobedience justified for Christians? Because that is a possibility that has to be brought into this discussion. When is ci civil disobedience justified for Christians? Well, civil disobedience is justified first when civil government oversteps the boundaries that God has placed on it. God places boundaries, as we've already established, on the civil government. They're there for the public good. What happens when it starts to turn inward and starts looking at how it can you know, really benefit itself and at the expense of the people? Or you know a lot of a very a variety of other things. Uh, that's not right. First Samuel, First Samuel, chapter thirteen, verses eight through fourteen. This is a bit of a longer passage. So this is um, King Saul is the king in question here, the first king of Israel. And he had a prophet that was sort of his counterpart, whose name was Samuel. The book is named after him. And Saul is waiting around for Samuel, and Samuel isn't showing up. And so Saul takes matters into his own hands. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, well, when I saw that the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. Saul took a responsibility upon himself that was not his to take. It was not his place to be the one to offer the, these burnt offerings. That was Samuel's job. So he overreached. 
He took for himself power and authority that did not belong to him, and in doing so violated what God had set up for the king to do. And this is, in many ways, the beginning of Saul's downfall as king. It only gets worse from here, and by the end of it, it gets pretty scary. I, I have a professor who, you know, there's a, there's a part where um, Saul is just so spun out of control that he's going and consulting a necromancer, a witch, which Israel is explicitly commanded to stay away from so that he can bring Samuel's ghost up from the dead to consult with him because Samuel was, you know, a big help him in the past, or so he thought. And I had a professor who used to refer to him at that point as Scary Saul. This is horror movie level stuff that he gets involved in at the end of his reign. He's so overreaching, he's so far gone that he is just out of control and he needs to be put down. And that's exactly what happens to Saul by the end of his reign. He goes to war and he loses and God through the opposing army puts Saul down. He judges Saul. So civil disobedience is justified when government officials overstep the boundaries God placed upon it. Number two, civil disobedience is justified when civil government forbids something that God commands. Sometimes God says, this is what you should do, and civil government may come along and say, nope, don't do that. Here's an example. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 29. But the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened up the prison doors and brought them out and said, go and stand at the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought out. But when the officer came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported, oh, we found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this could, would come to. And someone came and told them, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching to the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. When God commands something, I don't care what the civil government says. You, you do what God says, not the civil government. That is surely a cause for civil disobedience. Number three, civil disobedience is justified when civil, civil government endorses or permits something that God forbids. Sometimes God says, no, and the civil government says, no, this is good, you should do this. Matthew chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist, he has been raised from the dead. This is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Herod was doing something that God had expressly forbid. He was, being, he was acting adulterously with his brother's wife. 
and John acting as the sort of Elijah sort of prophet figure stood up and said, this is not okay. You are in violation of the law of God. He spoke truth to power. So, civil disobedience justified when civil government oversteps the boundaries God placed on it, when civil government forbids something that God commands, and when the civil government endorses or permits something that God forbids. Here's the thing about civil government. It's appointed by God. It, it, it bears some serious authority, but it is not absolute authority. This is the place where medieval kings went off the rails. And they talked about the divine right of kings. They would say, well, God has obviously appointed us, therefore, whatever we do is right and, and is permissible and no one can stop us. And then, you know, that didn't work out so well in the end because God judged that system. So when we look at these three different possibilities, in such cases, we should say this, Christians not only may disobey, disobey civil authorities, but rather they must. There are actually moments when the civil authority must be disobeyed. And we must say with the apostles in Acts chapter 5, we must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Civil government cannot and uh, has no place to come in and tell the church how it does things. If God has said, you gather, you gather. If God has said, this is how you worship, this is how you worship. Civil government doesn't have a place to say anything to that. Even if they think they do, they don't. Because God is the king of all kings, and he's the Lord over all lords. And as Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And from that, he says, therefore, go, which is him delegating the authority he has to us to do the work he commissions us to do. Go, therefore and make disciples of all what? Nations. Well, what's a nation? What's a nation? Is it just an individual person? Sometimes it's that word uh, for nations refers to an individual Gentile, but often it refers to these non-Jewish nations who don't know anything about the one true God of the Bible. The, the idea is that we bring nations to Christ. Nations to Christ. So make Christian nations. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of personal salvation, but also the responsibility of bringing salvation out beyond us. And thank you for knowing that sometimes we get our own ways wrong and we need help. We need an external guide. So God, we are now thinking of the civil government that you have established. We pray, Father, that we would be good citizens, that we would be people who are um, upholders of the good, the public good that the civil government is supposed to uphold. And Father, where they veer off from that, help us to be the ones who, like Samuel, who, like the other prophets, speak the truth to power when they need to hear it. And help us to be people who are examples of the shining light of the gospel to point people always back to you, whether that be neighbors, whether that be classmates, whether that be um, co-workers, or whether that be those who you have established an authority in the civil government. So, Father, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen.